morning we want to continue with our <coughs> season of identity that we've been in since September. Start off by telling you who we are as a leadership as a church. Then the months of October and November we're sharing who you are in the queue. And when we began that journey of talking about who you are in the queue, we said that all of you, all of us together, are people who have needs, deep, deep needs, and God wants to meet every need that we have. We talked about security, every person needs security. Last Sunday, we said that every person needs to know how to rebound in life because all of us stumble and fail and trip and fall. Teen Challenge ministered to our hearts, encouraged us that we can rebound in the name of the Lord. This morning, we have a little bit of a different slant to make. It's still a need you have. Every person needs to hear what the Lord is doing around the globe because all of us need encouragement. Sometimes we get caught in our own little world and we forget there's a world out there besides our city and God is moving by His Spirit transforming people's lives. And we have a need deep inside of us to know what God is doing. You're going to hear that this morning from our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is Reverend Paul Estabrooks, one of the speakers at Mission Fest in Brandon here this past weekend. He travels the globe with Open Doors International. He's a veteran missionary with a deep concern for Christians in restricted countries who are being persecuted. He's led many mission trips and has a heart for people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. He's going to bless. He'll challenge your hearts this morning. He's also a good fellow maritime from down east in your brunch. So give you a good hand to come. That's right, I am a herring choker from New Brunswick by birth, uh, but live in London, Ontario now. I want to show you some pictures before I share with, from God's Word with you this morning. Let's take a look at this video. <coughs> Ellos torturaron a nuestro pastor y al resto de la iglesia. Después vinieron y los mataron. Y nos dijeron que no podíamos orar ni alabar al Señor. The signature of that deep shook the shot of rain. When Tan and Rocky were sick, the Kabbas and Mahwa, we said, Yet this is Zana for a day. Like in the Ashara Mikeda, in the Ahomela, who I'm the Ashara Bima, and I was. Yo les dije, si me matan, voy a estar con Jesús. Ustedes me quieren matar o me quieren dejar vivir, me devotan, yo mando. spiritual battle as it rages around the world in which we live today. But the good news is that if you've read the last book of the Bible, you know that we win. Amen. Amen. Revelation 12, 11, the very central point of the letter that John writes to the churches of the first century. He says, we overcome him, the, the, the devil, referred to as the dragon in that chapter by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and being willing to even give our lives unto death. That's what's required. For some of us, it will be. For 
depending on the world today it is. But when you really look at the number of martyrs for Jesus Christ as a percentage of the church worldwide, it's a very, very small percentage. And yet the willingness to be that is what Jesus asks of you and me. I am a, a grandfather, a father, and a husband. I have seven grandchildren, three children, but only one wife. And she's praying for us today, back in London, Ontario, and it's really a joy to be with you. As I've worked for the last 34 years with Open Doors Ministry around the world, I'm often asked, don't you get depressed working among Christians who are being persecuted all the time? And actually, it's just the opposite. We go to visit them, to encourage them, and to minister to them, and every time you come home, you feel like, hey, who is the one encouraged? I'm the one. I went there thinking I was going to encourage them. In the old Soviet Union, the Christians used to tell us that we Christians are like nails. The harder you hit us, the deeper we go. In China, they say Christians are like bamboo. The more you cut us down, the faster and stronger we grow back. In Iran, where the church is growing faster than anywhere else in the world today, that the country of Iran, a Muslim theocracy that puts Christians in prison when they discover them if they're from Muslim background. In this country, Christians say we are like rubber balls. The harder you throw us down, the higher we rebound. They also say in Iran that we are like flowers. The more you crush us, the sweeter the fragrance. And in India, a country that exports lots of tea, says we Christians are like tea bags. We don't know how strong we are until we get put into the hot water. And that's true for you and me as well. We don't know how strong we are until we get tried in the hot water of life and life's situation. Well, our ministry has existed for 57, 58 now years. Brother Andrew, our founder, began then taking God's Word, which was the first thing Christians asked for after the universal request of Christians around the world. Christians around the world, no matter what their circumstances, asked first that you and I pray for them. The best thing we can do for other believers is to pray for them. Because they know God answers prayer. And if we will really pray for them, God's will will be done in their lives. Then they ask for things they need. And as Brother Andrew visited Christians in his early days in the Soviet <coughs> Union, in Eastern Europe, there was a desperate need for Bibles. And so Bibles became his main ministry, taking scriptures to Christians that didn't have them. And that started his whole ministry. Today we minister in a variety of ways in restricted countries through training, through social economic development projects like livelihood projects and encouraging Christians in different ways where they need help and encouragement. Brother Andrew has a new book out called No Guts, No Glory. That's a title he's always wanted to have on a book and no publisher would ever give him that joy of having this title. So, Open Doors published this book for him so he could finally get his title. <laughs> no guts, no glory. And it's slain today's giants. And I have a few out on the book table. I hope you'll take advantage of that as well as if you were at Mission Test yesterday. I shared about a night of a million miracles. 30 years ago when a group of 20 men on a tugboat in a barge took one million Bibles into China in one night. 232 tons, tons, of Chinese Bibles. It was, it was absolutely miraculous the way God worked. It took a million miracles to get us to the point where we delivered them. Then it took another million miracles to get those Bibles into the hands of a million Christians in China. And the whole story is in a book that I've written called Night of a Million Miracles, there are also a few copies out on the book table in the back. I hope you'll take advantage of after the service. If you would please turn in your Bibles, 
Father's Book. In the early service, we learned that B-I-B-L-E stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Okay. So take your book of Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, we will read a passage that the Apostle Paul writes to this church to whom he had written an earlier letter. They had some misunderstandings about that early letter, and so he writes them a second letter, not only correcting their misunderstandings, but adding things as the Apostle Paul was so famous for doing. And uh, in almost every letter that he wrote, I find the concluding remarks as powerful as the main subject to which he's addressing in his letter. And this is true here in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, in chapter 3, he begins, finally, but it's not final. It's like my daddy was a pastor, and uh, he used to say, finally, but it didn't mean anything, because you could count on another half hour after that. So I'm always very careful about using that word, finally, because uh, it lasts sometimes. The Apostle Paul is that way. There's a whole chapter that starts with the word finally. But in these final instructions, he gives us some very good insight into how we are involved with our brothers and sisters in the world today. And he starts in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 with these words. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. These three verses from God's Word present us with two very powerful prayer requests. First of all, that we pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. That's, that's an easy prayer request to identify. Secondly, that we pray that those who share the gospel will be protected from wicked and evil men. And thirdly, a principle that underlines these two prayer requests, and that is a great principle that God is faithful. Do you believe that? Amen. Turn to your neighbor next beside you and say, God is faithful. God is faithful. And we're going to see through illustration this morning just how faithful our God is, even in the most difficult circumstances of life. So let's begin with the first prayer request. Okay. Paul says to this church and to you and me through God's word today, pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. Just as it did with you, he said. He reminds this church how quickly the gospel developed among them in Thessaloniki and how their church expanded and how People were one for faith in Jesus, and their influence in that community developed. And Paul says, pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. And that's what's happening in our world today. God is already answering that prayer, and yet we need to continue with that prayer because of the need that yet remains. Yesterday at Mission Fest, I was sharing about how God has worked among the Chinese people in China. Uh, there are 100 million Christians, at least today, in that country, and how they have now a burden beyond themselves. They've always had a great mission outreach among their own people. Then their mission vision developed for the minority groups within their country. Uh, to such an extent, that recently, Open Doors uh, Contacts uh, made a trip to the North Korea border. North Korea is the part of the world where Christians suffer most severely and anywhere. It's most difficult to be a Christian in North Korea than any other country in the world. And so these Christian businessmen went to the border 
of North Korea to meet with those refugees who escaped from the country across the river into China, in the northeast part of China. And they were amazed at how these people came to faith in Jesus so easily when they heard the gospel presented to them, and yet how desperate their situation was, and as they helped them. And when these Chinese businessmen went back home to the central part of China, they started sending container loads of things, of goods, of help, for these refugees who come out of North Korea. And they've developed a, a burden for people of other parts of their country. But they've even gone beyond that. Uh, now the Chinese Christians say, we realize that there's a big world out there. What is one of the big challenges of our world today? It's Islam. And they say the gospel began in Jerusalem at the time the Holy Spirit was given. And they, the church was established then and said, we need to take the gospel back to the place where it all began, back to Jerusalem. And there's a movement among one group in China called the Back to Jerusalem Movement. But when you think of their challenge, what do they have to do? To take the gospel back to Jerusalem, they have to go through countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, or Syria, in order to get into Israel to take the gospel to Jerusalem. And that's their burden and their vision. And they know it is going to cost lives. They're prepared for the fact that they're going, possibly even losing their physical life, in order to gain it. And that's the vision that they have. And it's incredible what God is doing through people in what is now called the majority world. We used to call it the developing world. We sometimes call it the two-thirds world. Now it's the majority world, and a new, a new term has been coined by Philip Jenkins called the Global South, because the church is growing the fastest in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, essentially the southern part of our globe. And that's where God is at work today, and where things are happening in incredible, incredible pace and speed, and the gospel is going we need to pray for that China revival that is going global now, with 100,000 missionaries projected to take the gospel through the Muslim world and back to Jerusalem where it began. Secondly, God is working among the Muslim world peoples. And it's really exciting to know that there is a growing church among the believers from Muslim backgrounds. One of the most difficult situations. In, in the Muslim world today is for these people who come to Jesus and come to know him and have to then face the wrath of their persecution usually begins right at home among their own family, sometimes even with honor killing. Um, I was sharing a seminar in northern Iraq with a co-worker, Jim Cunningham from Trinity Western University. We traveled together teaching Standing Strong Through the Storm. And we were at a seminar in Erbil, in northern Iraq, among the Kurdish Christians. And there was a man there who looked very distressed. At coffee break, we went to him and said, Brother, it's obvious that something is troubling you. What is the problem? He said, oh, I need you to pray for me. Uh, I am a Christian from a Muslim family. And uh, my daughter has been put in prison. I was in prison. Why? He said, well, my brother, when my brother found out that I and my wife and daughter had all become followers of Jesus, he was sent by the family to kill us. And I was away the day he came in, but my wife and daughter were there, and he came in with a big knife to attack my wife and daughter and to kill them. And my daughter began to struggle with him just to hold him off. And something happened that when he brought the knife down, um, she was strong enough that the knife didn't touch her, but it went right into the heart of my brother, who was sent to kill. And so my daughter is now in prison, charged with murder of the man who tried to kill her because she's a Christian. And so we pray for this murder, encourage him. 
And uh, later, uh, she was actually exonerated by the judge as a case of self-defense. And then he said, now we need prayer because the rest of the family say, okay, you got away with this one, but now we are going to kill all of you. What are we going to do? And if you were in that situation, what would you ask of others to do for you? But God met their needs. Today they're in Turkey, country next door, serving the Lord faithfully, and God has blessed them and enabled them to continue their lives, even though challenged. I was sharing in the earlier service this morning about uh, visiting a missionary in the country of Yemen. Jim and I were doing a seminar there as well with uh, all Muslim background believers. Wonderful experience. Jim teaches at Trinity Western, and he says, I get so tired of 18-year-old students in my class who could care less about the subject I'm teaching. They just have to take this course. But when you get out in the field with people who are being persecuted, and you're there to share God's word, they're just sitting there soaking in everything you're willing to share. And it's such a difference for him. He loves it. When we were in Yemen. The missionary who lived there said, last month was Ramadan month of fasting for Muslims. On certain nights of Ramadan, they really believe that God is miraculously speaking to them. They also believe in dreams and visions. And do you know that Muslims all around the world are experiencing dreams and visions of a man in white? Uh, one missionary there said, that when I have a day off, I go find a taxi driver. And I say to him, the local language, could you take me to somebody you know who has had a dream or a vision of a man in white? He said, I haven't met a taxi driver yet who can't do that. And they take him to the family. He says, I want to tell this family who the man in white is. And that's the way many missionaries do ministry in the Muslim world today. Because God is revealing himself in special ways among these people. They don't all respond. They don't all look for that opportunity. So this missionary said, two mornings during Ramadan, I received a phone call early in the morning. A male voice on the other end of the line said, you don't know me, and I don't know you. But last night I had a dream, and in the dream I was given a telephone number. It was so vivid that I woke up and wrote the number down. Now I'm calling you, asking you, what is it I need to well, how is that for an open door? Speaking of open doors, I'm asking you, what do I need to know? Two times this happened. In both cases, he was able to share with these men and to lead them to faith in Jesus. He says, Muslims do not come to faith quickly. Rarely, he said, does a Muslim ever come to faith on the first hearing of the gospel, as we are often so used to in North America with uh, situations like our evangelists who have thousands of them responding to the gospel. But he said, when they finally make a decision, it's a solid decision to follow Jesus because they know the cost and the price they are going to have to pay for that decision to follow Jesus. But all over our world today, brothers and sisters, the church of Jesus Christ is growing even in the Muslim world. And that's the executive. How else could Iran have the fastest growing church in the world? 20% growth every year in the country of Iran. Second is Afghanistan, 15% growth every year in this totally Muslim country of Afghanistan, where there are 40,000 mosques and not one church building. There was a church in the early 1970s, but it was destroyed later after years of operation, because so many people came to Jesus that the authorities couldn't, couldn't stand having this church there anymore. But there is a church in Afghanistan. No buildings, but the church of Jesus is growing and developing. And God is blessing them and using them in special way. The third trend of our world today is the African church. Uh, I was teaching a perspectives class a couple of weeks ago in London, Ontario, where I live, and the, the, the uh, session was on the missionary movement since the 1800s to the present. 
And uh, I was really amazed when I read Ralph Winter's materials on this era of missionary work, especially for West Africa. The largest church in Africa is in Nigeria, in West Africa. And in the earliest years, missionaries from England would go there with a life expectancy of two years. Disease and challenges there often killed missionaries within two years of their going to the country. So when they went, they would ship their goods to the country in a coffin. So they had it ready for themselves within a couple of years. Can you believe it? You know, what's even more unbelievable is that people kept going, even knowing this. I mean, you say, well, the first group didn't know it, so they go. But after that, people committed themselves to share the gospel in West Africa, even knowing that disease or something was going to kill them within two years of their being there. But they continued to go and share God's word. <coughs> Today, the church, especially in Nigeria, largest church in Africa, most dynamic, most outgoing, most missionaries to the rest of the continent, and under uh, the sub Saharan area, down to South Africa, is possibly one of the fastest growing areas of the church even today because of what began through the work of God's people who committed themselves and gave their lives for sharing the gospel. So the Apostle Paul says, pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. That's a great prayer request because there are still 6,000 people groups in our world today that have not yet heard the gospel. 6,000, 40% of the population of our globe have yet to be reached at all with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 6,000 ethnic groups. Even though there's a church in every country of the world, these groups still exist that are unreached and need to have the gospel of Jesus Christ presented to them within their culture and within their language. So pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. There is still much to be done. Second prayer request, pray that those who share the gospel will be spared, or his actual word is delivered from wicked and evil men. He does not all have faith. But Paul here clearly identifies the fact that these wicked and evil men are not our enemies. Remember how Jesus taught his disciples and us that we are too Love our enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. Uh, bless those who curse you. And you read Luke chapter 6 and you can't help but realize what a radical message Jesus gives to those who follow him. And he identifies, Paul identifies in this passage who our enemy is. We really only have one enemy, and that's Satan. In verse 3, he says, He will. He will protect you from the evil one. It's the evil one who is our enemy, Satan. And he uses every tactic he can to try and uh, deflect uh, our serving Jesus. I was sharing in a Scandinavian country uh, a couple of years ago, and the pastor there told me after the service, he said, we are not persecuted here in Scandinavia. We are just seduced. Satan just seduces us, and we don't have to be persecuted because we have nullified in our effectiveness in serving Jesus. That was his estimation of their situation. The evil one is the one we need to be worried about, who is out to try and destroy the church of Jesus. Yet even when he does everything he can, it doesn't work. I mean, look at the, the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And in the beginning of Acts chapter 8, you have a great persecution that breaks out against the church of Jerusalem. And all of the apostles are scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And as they go, they share the gospel. In fact, one of my favorite speakers, David Wong from Asian Outreach of Hong Kong, says in the Chinese Bible, it's translated much better. It says, as they went, they gossiped the gospel. And, <laughs> Gossip the gospel, meaning using gossip in a positive sense. They just talked about Jesus everywhere they went. People said, Who is this Jesus? I 
didn't even know about it. And the church grew. Satan thought that he had pulled a coup by martyring Stephen, the great deacon of the church. And yet, God took that situation and totally turned it around. As these people left the city, they began sharing the gospel, and the gospel spread because of their commitment. So we need to pray for those who are being persecuted, those who are sharing the gospel, that God will protect them and use them. And let me give you a few examples of those who need to pray. Let's, let's uh, go ahead with the picture. Uh, this is from Nigeria. Uh, see the lovely ladies in the top left of the picture are all widows in Nigeria. Uh, almost all of them, it's my understanding, that their husbands were martyrs for Jesus because of their evangelistic work. And these ladies are left uh, to run a family on their own. They're all widows in Nigeria. But the death of their husbands has been some years back. They have uh, their broken hearts have healed. And look at those beautiful smiles on these ladies. I just love this picture. It is such a beautiful picture of what God can do in the lives of those who have been broken. And the picture down at the bottom is the newest widow that I know of, Gladys Juma. And uh, Gladys is trying to smile, but she still has that broken heart, and it's very hard for her. Her pain is still raw. She's angry and confused, still asking God why it happened to her husband. Her husband, Ben, was a medical doctor. And Ben took a team from their church on a mission trip into the northern part of the country, which is dominantly Muslim. They were ministering in this area, uh, helping with medical care and other things, and uh, false accusations were made against them by a Muslim group who whipped up the anger of the mob, and the mob proceeded to kill everybody on that mission team trip, including Benjamin, her husband, and Gladys, mother of four kids, lost her husband just recently, and she's still in deep turmoil over that. And she said, all my husband Ben did was to sell out to Jesus, and that love cost him his life. Somewhere deep in my spirit, I know that something good will eventually come out of this. And she begins to think through this whole process. She says, actually, a neighbor gave his life to Jesus at the funeral of my husband. Because he said he had long admired my husband's faith, and if my husband was willing to die for that faith, he wants that kind of a God too. Even at our church, she says, there is a kind of revival as people react to Ben's death. For that I praise God. And then she concludes her letter by saying, please pray for me. Knowing that others are praying for me holds me together. Have you ever heard feelings of broken people. The most common comments I hear in Canada is that I am falling apart. I am falling apart. Gladys says, as a Christian, when I know you're praying for me, that holds me together. Brothers and sisters, we can pray for these kind of people who need to be held together by the body of Christ around the world. And Gladys is one of those for her. If you get our newsletters, you will learn about these kinds of people and be able to pray for them effectively. Next slide is from the country of Eritrea. And uh, this is Helen Burhani. Uh, Helen is a musician in Eritrea, produced a CD, a uh, Christian CD, circulated among young people. The government did the like and they put her in the shipping container prison. For 10 years, Evangelical Christians are illegal in Eritrea. You cannot worship in an evangelical church. If you do, you end up in prison. There are almost 2,000 Christians in prison today in Eritrea who are just doing that, worshiping together in some form that has been declared by their government as illegal. They don't have that many prison cells, so they put them in shipping containers, like you see at the bottom right. Shipping containers that have no windows, 
no light, no fresh air, no toilet facilities at all. Helen says they were allowed out once a day at 10 o'clock in the morning in an open field with no privacy to do their thing. That was it. And hot in the daytime, cold in the nighttime. And today there are almost 2,000 of our brothers and sisters in those kind of shipping containers in Eritrea. They can simply get out by signing a document that they will no longer follow Jesus. They refuse to sign that document. And Helen was there for three years in a shipping container. And she writes, when we first got into that container, everyone was very despondent. Many of the women were angry. They asked me what we should do, and I knew they were expecting me to say that we should shout or bang the container to let our captors know that we're not going to tolerate this kind of treatment. But I remember reading about how Christians, like nightingales, could not be prevented from singing even in captivity. And I suggested that we sing. We should praise God in spite of the fleas, in spite of the lice, in spite of the heat. We should thank God despite our circumstances. So she says, I began to sing with them, and pray and share the word of God from memory. And Helen was a tremendous source of encouragement to Christians in those, in those shipping containers. And her, her book, it's called Song of the Nightingale, and it documents what life is like in shipping container prisons in that country. The next picture is from a country of tremendous pain right now. Well, actually, this is from Iran. I was getting ahead of myself. But I want to tell you about these two lovely ladies from the country of Iran who uh, were new believers from Muslim background and began to work for Jesus in their country. In three years, they distributed, just these two girls, distributed 20,000 Bibles, one by one, to individuals in a Muslim country where this is forbidden and totally illegal. 20,000 Bibles these girls shared personally with people whom they met. One of their tactics was to get into a taxi, a taxi that continued to pick up people, multiple people, and drive around the city. They found a taxi driver who was not antagonistic toward them, and they spent the whole day, all day in the taxi, and as people got in, they would witness to them and offer them a Bible. They said, in three years, only once did anyone turn down receiving a copy of the Bible. And in three years, they gave 20,000 Bibles, established two significant house churches of new believers, all Muslim background believers, and then get put in prison for that. And they spent almost a year in a horrible prison, but their testimony of how God used them in that prison will blow your mind. Think, how can you imagine in this horrible situation that God can do such great things? And they've written about it in a brand new book that's just out called Captive in Iraq. And I highly recommend it to you can get it on Amazon. Um, but it is really worth the read to hear how God uses people like two young ladies in the country of Iraq. The next picture is from Syria, a country where uh, there is so much hurt and pain at the moment with the civil war that's gone on, especially among our brothers and sisters. 100,000 Christians, at least, have been driven from their homes, living in refugee camps on the borders of Turkey and Lebanon, as well as inside Syria today. Um, we do not normally do relief and development work. Brother Andrew says World Vision and Samaritan's Purse and other groups do a much better job than we do. But the need for Syrian Christians is so significant that we've actually started a $5 million project helping Christians in these refugee situations. Um, we serve 8,000 families every month in those refugee camps right now. Uh, and the, the numbers are growing, and it's incredible. This pastor, you can find him on YouTube, for those of you who are YouTube fans. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've heard George Gerber recently announced that he had heard that, uh, that um, Facebook and YouTube and 
quicker, were all going to combine into one service. And it was going to be called You Twitface. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you go to You Twitface, no, you, you too, you will find this man that uh, reports there. He's a pastor from Syria. And here's what he says. My people are hurting. He says, I can cry like Nehemiah because the walls of our city are burning and the people are in great trouble and distress. I can weep like Jeremiah because of the intensity and the spread of evil. I can mourn like David because of the indiscriminate, brutal killing of innocent people. Innocent people are paying the heavy toll of this evil. It's gloomy, sad, and painful. But then he goes on to say, we deeply appreciate the prayers of God's people everywhere. It is a rare time where the church in Syria is feeling the true oneness of the body of Christ all over the world. And for this we thank the Lord, for it is a great encouragement to us. And so brothers and sisters, almost every day there's something about Syria in the news. When you hear the news about Syria, remember we have family there. Brothers and sisters who are hurting, being driven from their homes. While we're in the comfort of ours, they've lost theirs. And all they ask for us is to pray for them, to remember them, to be one with them uh, in the body of Christ. Well, Paul says, pray for the gospel to spread rapidly. Pray for those who share the gospel, that they'll be protected from wicked evil men. But underlying all of this is this great principle that God is faithful. Say it with me. God is faithful. Amen. And he is faithful. And the persecuted church are the first to witness to anyone that despite their circumstances, they have found that God is faithful. And the one I want to uh, illustrate for you this morning in closing is from the next picture from Hey Wu. Hey Wu is a young lady. I can't show you her picture because of security reasons. Uh, I met her in Paris last year. We were both sharing in a conference there. And uh, she's a little lady, probably about 60 years of age now, uh, who has had an incredibly difficult life. Uh, she lost uh, children in the famine of North Korea in the middle 90s. And her husband then died. And so she's struggling alone Made, made the journey across the river into China, where if they're discovered, they'll be sent back to North Korea, getting either labor camp or execution as a result. But in China, she met Jesus Christ. People there, ministry people, all of them uh, of Chinese citizenship, ministering to the North Korean refugees who come across that river border. And she met Jesus. And she went back to North Korea, but she was discovered and put into labor camp because she had been uh, unfaithful to her country, they said, in going to China, especially becoming a Christian. And so she's in labor camp. And what, here's the report that she gives about God's faithfulness, even in one of the most wretched conditions in the world. She said, God showed me which prisoners I should approach. So I went to the person, told him or her what is in Acts 16, 31. When people believe in Jesus, they and their household will be saved. It was an encouraging message for these prisoners because they walked on the edge of death every day. They were easily converted to Jesus, not only because of what he said, but they saw the Holy Spirit working in me. And so a secret fellowship of Christians came into existence terrible labor camps in North Korea. And we gathered in secret places like, and I think the translator used a very gentle translation, like the rest of the That's got to be Canadian, eh? The original word was latrine. Okay? And if you have any idea of the way Asian bathrooms are, a big hole in the ground over which a few boards are placed. And it was the smelliest place in the camp, and the guard it was so bad that the guards would not go anywhere near the toilets. And so this is where the Christians found a place they could be secret and get together and worship. So every Sunday, these five Christians in this camp worshiped the Lord 
in the latrines, where they probably had to wear no slips, but at least they were free to praise the Lord and free to together in privacy. And Hebrew says, God was faithful to us. She was ultimately released. Today she lives in South Korea, sharing what God is doing in North Korea among his people. Brothers and sisters, despite all the challenges we face, we can trust the fact that God is faithful. And so on the basis of that, we pray, God, may your church grow around the world. Be with those who share the gospel and protect them from the evil and wicked men, the people that Satan our enemy uses, evil and wicked men. We need to know Jesus also. And so as we live in the comforts of Canada, I realize that some of this has been a little graphic, but you know, the more I learn about the persecuted church, the more my problems become very, very small. Very small. And while our brothers and sisters have to live in many conditions around our world today, it makes me realize just how blessed we are. We have no idea how long that blessing will continue. And so we learn from lessons to help us to be effective followers of Jesus Christ. Pray that the gospel will spread rapidly. Pray that those who share the gospel will be protected. And remember that God is faithful. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do pray today for the fact that 6,000 people groups in this world still have been figured the gospel. We thank you the way your, your gospel is spreading so quickly in many parts of the world. And we pray for those who will go to the unreached peoples with the gospel of Jesus, that you will protect them, that you will honor your word, that they will understand and realize your faithfulness. And I pray the same for my brothers and sisters here this morning. Lord, may we be those who do pray, that we know how to pray effectively for those who share the gospel around our world. And we thank you for the oneness in Christ we have in the body of Christ in other parts of the world, even when we don't know them personally. And we thank you above all for your faithfulness. Lord, we stand on that faithfulness until the day when we see you face to face. Jesus Thank you for those words this morning you shared with us. Would you stand with me today? And as we close, I'm going to Breeze is going to finish the song as you're dismissed. Today, if you come, you'd like to have someone pray with you, agree with you, lift up your knee before the Father. Instead of going out the doors, why don't you join us in the front? And we'd be privileged and honored to pray with you and agree with you. Thank you for coming. May the Lord richly bless you and give you an incredible week. In Jesus' name.